Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Tonight, we're very lucky to be joined by Denise Hertzing, who's uh, come to us uh, where, uh, from the Wild Dolphin Project, where she is the research director, uh, and she's uh, completed 28 years of long-term study into the Atlantic spotted dolphins in in inhabiting Bahamian waters. Uh, she did a BS in uh, marine zoology and uh, an MA in behavioral biology, uh, and a PhD in behavioral biology and environmental studies in, uh, uh, completed in 1993. Uh, she is an uh, affiliate assistant professor in biological sciences at uh, the Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton. Uh, she uh, was the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2008. Uh, she's a fellow with the Explorers Club, uh, scientific advisor for the Lifeboat, F Lifeboat Foundation and the American Cetacean Society. Uh, and uh, she is on the board of Schoolyard Films. And, uh, in addition to many uh, scholarly articles, she's the author of two books, including a new book called Dolphin Diaries uh, and The Wild Dolphin Project. Uh, she's authored and co-authored many papers in the fields of whale biology, animal communi communication and human consciousness. And coverage of her work has, uh, has, has made its way into the New York Times, National Geographic, BBC, uh, Ocean Realm, um, and uh, as far afield as uh, the NHK uh, network in Japan. So today we're going to hear from her about uh, the links between Dolphin Communications and, and SETI and a bit more about her research. So if you'll join me in welcoming Denise. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay. Well, it's really nice to be at SETI. Uh, I've been a big fan of SETI for decades, and if I hadn't been studying dolphins for the last 30 years, I might be in the astrobiology field. But uh, I wanted to share with you, with my uh, time with you tonight, uh, some thoughts about how SETI and astrobiology overlap a little with dolphin research. And this talk actually uh, was born from a conversation with some SETI colleagues at various workshops over the last few years where we were uh, discussing non-human intelligence and ways to look at that and I found myself in these casual conversations about dolphin signals and clicks and whistles and I thought you know there's probably a discussion to be had about how we process and look at dolphin signals uh, in our own research that, that overlaps with SETI but I also decided on an alternative title for the talk <laughs> because I, I realize it might be a little strange uh, to some of you like what is the connection but in fact, SETI has a pretty good history with dolphin research and dolphin researchers. Uh, back in 1961, when Frank Drake did his meeting at the Green Bank facility, he had some attendees there, and they were apparently uh, christened as the Order of the Dolphin, <laughs> which I'd love to hear from Frank sometime what the ritual involved in that was. <laughs> but among the people there, including Carl Sagan and Barney Oliver and other greats, was a neuroscientist called John Lilly. And he was probably the first uh, person and the first scientist ever to propose from looking at the structure of the brain itself that dolphins were really intelligent and probably had complex communication. Um, he, after that, he started working at Marine World Africa USA, which was right here in Redwood City for years. And he started studying his own brain a little too much on drugs, so his work didn't go too far. <laughs> but he, he was actually a visionary and just was really a, a ahead of his time, honestly. Uh, then in the late uh, 1980s and early 90s, Lori Marino, Diana Reese, and uh, Gordon Gallup proposed to use self-recognition tests with mirrors for dolphins with the possibility that they might be an intelligent species, and they published their work shortly thereafter. In the late 1990s, uh, the SETI Institute's own Lawrence Doyle, along with Brenda McCowan and uh, Sean Hanser, actually started looking at the dolphin's whistle repertoire relative to information theory, looking at the complexities of those signals. And then in the last uh, five, four or five years, there have been a series of workshops at the astrobiology conferences based on ways of looking at non-human intelligence. Now, we might want to start thinking about that, perhaps, in ways we hadn't. Um, and this has generated website, uh, interesting website on intelligence and various workshops. And Claudio Maconi, who's speaking here next week, actually has uh, included that in a series of workshops on searching for life signatures. So there's been a bit of discussion about dolphins and uh, non-human intelligence actually over the decades. 
Now, there are three main areas I think that uh, SETI and, and astrobiology actually overlap with dolphin research. The first is using dolphins as a model for non-human intelligence. Because if you're going to assess a non-human intelligence or compare it or uh, um, look at definitions, granted they're non-technological intelligences, dolphins are probably a good place to start. The second area, and this is the area I'm going to focus on mostly tonight, is on signal detection and decoding, because we all do this with our dolphin research. We're detecting signals, trying to understand and interpret their meaning. So signal acquisition and looking for signatures of intelligence within a signal is something uh, we all do. And thirdly, uh, dolphins are a potential exercise in direct contact, should that ever happen, regarding etiquette and also how we might share communication, cognition, and perhaps exchange language in the event that that might be a possibility in the future. So first looking at uh, non-human intelligence, looking at for signatures of life in astrobiology is, is probably a good model for looking at signatures of intelligence because looking for signatures of life, we've really looked across various scales from the atomic to planetary. And extremophiles have really taught us that organisms Organisms in life can be so diverse and so uh, different in our definitions of life. And we might apply this kind of a focused thought to looking for signatures of intelligence. Because in the past, we focused on primate intelligence, which is very human-like in, in many ways, and we recognize it, social mammals and birds. But we might have to stretch our thoughts a little bit when we talk about uh, other definitions of intelligence. Now, traditionally, we've had quite a linear your view of intelligence and it's revolved around keeping us humans unique because we think we're only the ones that uh, only ones that use tools that have self-awareness that use referential communication and that have some kind of syntax or signal order to our our uh, sounds and so the trajectory has been towards human-like intelligence but along the way we've seen a lot of evidence for tool use by many species birds chimps including dolphins we know that many species now test for self-awareness using mirrors, including dolphins and recently elephants. Uh, some species, terrestrial species, use referential communication and their alarm calls to communicate really specific information. And uh, dolphins, specifically, as, long, as well as chimps, use uh, symbolic information and can learn artificial languages. So animals have really stepped up to the plate when they've been uh, challenged with these kinds of definitions. Now, uh, just one exercise we've also been doing at some of the non-human intelligence uh, workshops is trying to just figure out how could you really look at different types of intelligence, even beyond mammals looking at organisms like an octopus or a bee. You know, they just simply might have different kinds of types of intelligence. We might want to scale them across other dimensions besides ones that seem critical for our kind of intelligence. So th these are just some of the exercises uh, that we tend to go through for looking at non-human intelligence. But there's a reason why we are interested in, in dolphins, because certainly by physical measures, and one of physical measures for intelligence is a measure of brain-to-body ratio called the encephalization quotient. And much of this work was actually done by Alori Marino, who's worked with the SETI Institute before. And dolphins actually rank second only to humans uh, for encephalization quotient, even uh, greater than the uh, great apes. But all of us have a few things in common, and that is to have, we all have complex uh, social structures and politics, we have complex communication signals, and we have some other uh, aspects of our, of our anatomy that, uh, for example, spindle cells that give us fast transmission of information and mirror neurons for empathy. So a lot of us think that there's convergent evolution in intelligence, and a lot of different species can converge on the same, uh, same exercise in intelligence. Now, dolphins also stack up on uh, behavioral and cognitive measures of intelligence. Um, most of this work has been done in captivity at the Koala Basin a Marine Mammal Lab in, California, I'm sorry, in Hawaii. And dolphins basically have been uh, taught and can learn artificial languages, both acoustic and gestural. And they can understand both word order and word meaning. So this is a pretty higher level skill. They can understand abstract concepts like looking at a TV screen and understanding a two-dimensional image that rep actually represents a three-dimensional activity. And dolphins are very good at imitation and mimicry and quite exquisite at vocal learning. So these are all features that really um, uh, let us think that they have these advanced uh, skills in communication. 
There's also reasons that they're candidates for social learning, such as actually teaching. Um, and this is because they're a long-lived species. Um, there are about 30 species of dolphins, so some of it depends on what species you're talking about. But many small dolphins can live into their 50s, so they have these long lives. They live in these mixed age class groups and multi-generation groups. There's a, a lot of potential for information transfer and learning. And we know now how important being an individual is and how important their personalities are. And, and in some cases, there's been evidence where one dolphin can be the broker between groups. And if you lose that individual within the society, things can break down. So individuals and personalities have been uh, fairly well studied in the last uh, five years. Um, dolphins in some parts of the world actually use tools, such as in uh, Shark Bay, Australia. This dolphin is pushing a, a sponge that she's dug up from the bottom to protect her rostrum or her beak from a poisonous fish. And this is actually a cultural behavior that's passed down matrilineally. So it's not a feature of the environment or genetics. It's actually something they learn and they pass on to their offspring. And of course, mirror self-recognition tests have now been uh, used uh, with dolphins, with orcas, and as I mentioned, other creatures. And this is usually a measure of self-awareness. So they seem to have all these traits that really point towards another type of intelligence, with some parallels uh, with humans, certainly. <coughs> but probably, probably the biggest commonality we have is about signal detection and decoding. So with uh, SETI and astrobiology, it's, it's somewhat like sitting in a boat and dropping an underwater microphone, a hydrophone in the water. It's that we can't always see our subjects. We don't know where the sound's coming from necessarily, although we can figure that out. We don't know who's, who's doing it. So I wanted to share some surprises and challenges that we've had in dolphin research that have taught us some lessons. Uh, these include things like signal-to-noise issues that we've discovered with a dolphin sounds, issues in their production and hearing and how they relate or don't relate. Categorizing signals is a big issue uh, with dolphin sounds for many reasons that we'll look at. And then what we're really interested in, of course, is the meaning and the interpretation of signals. And how do you even begin to do that with another species? And then finally, just an interesting example of how important it is to follow the data instead of relying on theories that maybe don't match with your data. So we work in different environments. And we have some differences. Uh, water is a very dense medium and compared to space. Uh, you work in long distances, we tend to work in shorter distances. <coughs> you guys are in the gigahertz, we're in the kilohertz. We both have source localization issues, so that is a similarity. And our time scales are a bit different. Uh, we work real time in, in days, and of course we're talking about uh, years and years for some radio signals, potentially. And you guys have the big expensive toys. <laughs> we have things out of backyards and garages. <laughs> Not really, but, but they tend to be smaller and, and customized specifically because we're a pretty small field, really. So um, <clears throat> my goal uh, in my work has been to really try to crack the code and decode the dolphin's natural signals. And when I was a graduate student, I really realized I wanted to find a place in the wild where I could plant myself like researchers had done with primates and elephants and really observe a society long term and try to figure out how they were communicating. So um, I was pretty lucky. I found a place in the Bahamas where there was a, a resident community of Atlantic spotted dolphins, which is the species I work with. And the Bahamas is an archipelago nation. It's just east of Florida. And basically, a lot of its landmass is submerged. In fact, most of it's submerged. So there are these lovely shallow sandbanks. These are islands here. And basically, the dolphins live on these shallow sandbanks. They're resident all year round because they have plentiful sources of fish. And they, they spend their daytime on the shallows because it's safe from predators, and they rest, and they socialize. And at night, they can go off this deep water edge, and they hunt for fish and squid. So I decided to plant myself there for the last 28 years and uh, track uh, the society. Now, the, the species I work with are Atlantic spotted dolphins, Stenella frontalis. And uh, the calves are born without spots, and they get spots with age. So they're a pretty nice species to work with because their developmental phases are fairly easy to track because of the degrees of spotting. And we identify individuals using photo ID. This is a standard technique 
with tracking individuals uh, with dolphins. So we take pictures of their dorsal fins. And because they have spots, like your constellations of stars, we can actually track unique spot marks. So th this is how we would track an individual through its life history. Now, uh, the adult here, the mother, she, this is Muggsy, and she's about 35 years old in this shot. And they can live till about 50. Um, normally, I would go through a lot of their life history information, but I'm kind of cutting to the chase tonight, tonight. But they have long lives. They have clear developmental periods where they learn and uh, play and interact with each other. Um, they're a promiscuous species, so they don't mate for life or anything like that. So, and they love sex, 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 sex. They always have a lot of time to practice sex, like bonobo chimps. Um, and they have complicated relationships and uh, social lives, basically. <laughs> So we basically go out in a, a catamaran, the Wild Dolphin Project got donated in 1992, and it's a liveaboard boat, so we go out for about five months every summer and we basically plant ourselves where the dolphins live and try to get time with them, with them observing underwater and, and studying them. Now in most parts of the world, it's just simply difficult to see underwater, and this is really why uh, dolphin communication research in the wild has been so difficult. You know, it's just not possible in many parts of the world. But if you want to interpret behavior, you know, you try to look at surface behavior and you see these animals, they look like they're jumping and playing like they might at a marine park. But in fact, what's usually happening underwater is they're beating the crap out of each other. And that's why it's really important to see what they're doing when they're making sounds, and, and rather than depending on surface activity. So most of our work is purely observational, recording, and trying to uh, observe what they do in uh, detail. So we're actually in the water with the animals most of the time. One of my main tools is an underwater video camera with a hydrophone, which is underwater microphone. And this is so I can record simultaneous sound and behavior. And most of the work is non-invasive. We truly, really try not to touch and feed and chase the animals. We try to really be benign for the most part. Sometimes the animals interact. Sometimes we're just observing. So over the last 28 years, we've identified about 300 individuals. And we're tracking three generations. So we've got grandmothers, grandfathers, um, who we identify using uh, DNA from their fecal material, actually. Which is a, a tricky subject to talk about, but, <laughs> but anyway. But it's really important to understand the sensory systems of an animal you're studying. And dolphins are great acousticians, of course. Uh, they make high frequency sounds, uh, 10 or 20 times above ours. But they also have other senses. They have really good vision, and they're both monocular and binocular vision because they're both prey and predators, so their eyes are on the sides of their heads and at some point when it, uh, they have binocular vision they get some depth of field and they have cross modal abilities between these two senses, between sound and vision. They have the chemical sense of taste, they do not have smell. And touch is very important to dolphins. And it turns out that sound can be felt in the water because the acoustic impedance between water and your skin or tissue is about the same. So they can actually tickle each other and buzz each other from afar. So instead of just focusing on what sounds dolphins make, we really try to get the big picture and look at all the signals that they make because like I'm waving my hands and doing things like that as well as talking to you. Dolphins also have body postures and subtleties like that. Now they're uh, both passive listeners and active producers of sound. And they're quite exquisite passive listeners. So lots of times they're just listening for cues in their environment, um, such as predators or the sound of the environment. They also are quite quiet and listening in murky water, which is a bit counterintuitive because they're supposed to be using their echolocation or their sonar to see things. And you'd think when it's murky and they didn't have their vision, they would use sound. But in fact, they're listening for cues, probably because they get backscatter from the particulate matter in the water. But when they hear a cue, then they will actively produce their sonar, their echolocation, to explore uh, a predator or whatever the cue is. And they actively produce sounds to hunt. So they're both good listeners and active producers of sound. Now, I'm just going to show you a few basic correlations we have with dolphin behavior and sounds. And this is kind of the level at which we're at with dolphin communication in many levels. So one of the types of sounds dolphins make are frequency modulated whistles. I'll play one here. And the spectrogram is within human audible, so you actually do hear these sounds in the water at 15 kilohertz. So whistles, these whistles are social. They're long distance, so they can go about 10 kilometers or so. 
Um, they're quite easily studied, and they've been the most studied sound simply because they're easy to measure. We can easily measure a contour. Um, there's a specific type of whistle that we call a signature whistle, and it really functions as a name. So an individual dolphin can broadcast his or her name, or he or she can call another dolphin by name with a little addition of part of their, their whistle. There's some really lovely new work out of uh, St. Andrews on that, which actually shows their voice in the, uh, when they're making each other's signature whistles. This is just a little video. This is a, a calf who's uh, producing a whistle. And these whistles we typically see when a mother's trying to reunite with a calf. <laughs> Sometimes sound like squeaky little rubber tires. And sometimes we have visual cues like bubbles coming out of the blowhole, and this is how we would match a whistle with an individual or localize the sound on that individual. Now, there are many ways to look at signature whistles. Uh, some of the more common are just uh, visual measures, because as human beings, we're actually pretty darn good at looking at visual patterns. So on the left, you see four different types of signature whistles uh, from different individual dolphins. So this would give you a qualitative uh, measure of how different whistles are. Or we use standard statistical techniques like uh, principal component analysis and other ways to measure whistles. Uh, we also can use neural nets. Neural nets are pretty handy tools uh, for whistle measurement. And in this case, uh, we're comparing a mother and a calf whistle. So one whistle is green, one whistle is red. And the computer is basically generating a, a, some, a kind of index that tells us how difficult it is to discriminate the whistles apart. So these whistles, a computer can't uh, very well discriminate them. On the right, you see two juvenile whistles. These animals are unrelated. One whistle is green, one whistle is red. The computer can nicely separate these whistles. And so it can give us a quantitative measure of how different the whistles are. So we can start asking questions like, how different is a male calf's whistle? from its mother than a female calf's whistle, those sorts of things. So there's qualitative techniques and there's quantitative techniques that have been used. Now another type of sound that's been heavily studied, uh, mostly because of the Navy, are echolocation clicks. So this is their sonar. These are actually broadband signals. You're only seeing the uh, human audible component there. But these are signals typically used for navigation, feeding, orientation. They're close proximity uh, signals. They only go about a kilometer or so. And this is just a little video showing you. These, are, these are dolphins that are echolocating under the sand, looking for and chasing out fish. Keep hoping they'll show me the buried treasure, but it would be good for funding. So they can also take these echolocation clicks, which are very short duration clicks, and they can package them really tightly in time and create a buzz. And this is a social sound, so instead of clicks being used for feeding and navigation, now they're packaging these clicks and uh, using them for social reasons. This is one of my favorite sounds. I have to play it again, if I can find it. Oh well, maybe not. So uh, these are sounds that are used during courtship. The male will buzz the female to stimulate her, tickle her, whatever, whatever they do. Um, again, close proximity sounds, and we're pretty sure these sounds can be felt. Um, people have actually, researchers have measured sensitivity of dolphins in different areas of their body, and in fact, uh, it's pretty easy to see that they can feel this kind of level of sound that comes out of, of a dolphin. Um, it's also the same kind of sound that a mother will use to discipline its young. So if a calf gets out of line, a mother will actually hold uh, the calf down at the bottom and buzz him in uh, discipline until he stops squeaking and gets back to the surface. It's also the same sound that dolphins use to chase away sharks. And you can actually see the shark kind of twitching. So again, we think there's a tactile component uh, to this kind of sound. Handy sound. Uh, this is, let's see, this is courtship video, just to show you a little courtship. So typically, when a male, a female goes into estrus, uh, male, their male alliance, three to four individuals, and they'll stack up underneath her. So this is a female dolphin with her two-year-old calf underneath her. 
These are male dolphins that are all upside down, trying to get uh, access belly to belly with the female. Calf is in the way. And the female's not interested in these males. She can actually slap them away. So there's a little bit of female choice, it looks like. In it. But what's always really striking to me during this kind of behavior is how much exposure the calves are getting at this age to all the signals that dolphins use, sound, behavior. So it's very rich learning environment, even if the calf is just observing. It's quite a rich thing. Now, dolphins are also political animals because they have complex uh, social relationships. So here we have a democratic dolphin on the left, a Republican on the right, and here's the independent guy back here trying to figure out which group to join. Um, but dolphins can be aggressive with each other. They have to resolve conflicts because they are political. And they use very typical mammalian signals. Here you see a head-to-head -head behavior, right? That's a very mammalian uh, signal. And during this kind of behavior, we hear another kind of sound, which are called burst pulse sounds. And these are specifically burst pulse squawks. And I know they sound like ducks, but they're dolphins. <laughs> Believe me, I promise. Um, again, close proximity signals, so they're used for close social interactions. Um, they're the most common sound. They're much more common than whistles in the dolphin's repertoire, but they're the least studied. And the reason why they're least studied is they're simply hard to measure. So it's really been hard for scientists to get a handle on categorizing these kinds of sounds because of that, sadly, because they're probably pretty interesting and we suspect they carry a lot of communicative information. So this is a video of a typical dolphin's fight. So you'll see two groups, kind of going to go head to head, with some open mouths, little bubble. So this is the standoff. Typically, one group will back down from the other, nobody will get hurt, and they all swim away and they resolve their conflict. So they can get fairly aggressive, but usually they resolve conflicts. As far as we don't, we don't know that they kill each other, for example. That's really never been observed in the wild yet. Now, dolphins have pretty complicated uh, sound producing and receiving mechanisms, and I just wanted to go, over, go through it because it's pretty complex. So here's the dolphin head, and here's the brain skull brain here in the skull. And the front of the skull is a bit like a parabolic reflector. And the way dolphins produce sounds is both their nasal tracts, so they have two nasal tracts that have migrated to the tops of their heads into one blowhole. So underneath the blowhole, which is technically their nose, their breathing apparatus, they have two air sacs. And they basically are shunting air back and forth between these sacs, and they're vibrating a, a flap that's creating the clicks. When the sounds are created, they either go right out or they bounce off the parabolic reflector area of the skull and they go through this front part of the dolphin's head, which is actually called the melon. And this is a fatty structure that actually can change shape and help focus the beam of sound. So the sound goes out, hits a fish, and it comes back. And it, because they don't have these external ears like we do, right, to receive sound, uh, they receive sound through another fatty structure, which is in their lower jaw. And then the sound is transmitted to an inner ear complex. That's a very mammalian inner ear complex like ours. It has a few specializations. It's isolated by air, so they can use time differential uh, to locate signals. And it has uh, high frequency abilities. But one really important thing, well, many important things to remember about how dolphins make sound is that they're very directional senders and very directional receivers. So they're high frequency and their loudest sounds are sent pretty much on axis with low frequencies dropping off axis. It's the same with receiving sounds. They actually receive sounds high frequency in the center of their lower jaw and then lower frequencies drop off. A few complicated things that make the life of a researcher a little tough is that they can produce two sounds at once. So they have two independent sound producing mechanisms. So they can be making a whistle and a click at the same time, which really sucks. <laughs> you're trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, another thing that's really challenging, so if you're really trying to get the full signal of a dolphin, you really want to get on axis and record their sounds head on. It turns out that internally, and we just learned this a few years ago actually, internally the dolphins can move the sound without moving their head. So they can point about maximum about 20 degrees. So really tough. 
tough on recording things. And they have the abilities to modulate frequency, amplitude, and uh, duration independently. So they can really have a lot of potential information being modulated in their sounds. Um, so if you look, look at the transmission beam of a dolphin, uh, the other little complication is their blowhole is a little skewed to the left, just the way it's evolved. So actually they have kind of a, a lobe here on the left of more uh, intense sound, but it's pretty much head-on axis with a little skew to the left because of that asymmetry. But what that means is, if again, if you're recording a dolphin signal and you want to get the full broadband signal, you really want to get in front of the animal to get the high-frequency components because if you record to the left or the right of the dolphin, you're going to get into the lower frequencies. So that's been a, a very big issue for research both in captivity and in the wild is that a lot of signals we collect are probably partial signals if we don't know the directionality of the sender or the orientation uh, during a recording. So that's, that's a pretty uh, big issue. <clears throat> now, for years we uh, worked just with narrow band collection just because of the uh, technical abilities of, of equipment when the digital age came about. And I, I'm always at conferences looking for really smart students with good toys. And uh, I ran into uh, Mark Lammers, who was a PhD student working with Whitlowau in Hawaii, who we called Mr. Sonar. And they were actually working with spinner dolphins and had developed a system of uh, recording at least for a 10 second snippets a device that could record some of their high frequency sounds. So the device on the left is uh, called a UDAS. And the yellow component is my normal underwater video camera with an omnidirectional hydrophone. And on the bottom is basically a PC in a box that has a directional hydrophone. And these two systems are synchronized, so now when we started using this system, we could get in the water, get our video of the dolphins, and take uh, 10 seconds of snapshots of higher frequencies that we knew were probably there, we just couldn't hear nor could we record. Now the next version of this, which was developed by another PhD student, Mikiel Schoten from the Netherlands, who we work with, um, he added to this now a four-channel hydrophone array. And what this does is it allows us to localize the vocalizer by triangulating uh, where the signal comes in relative to the hydrophones. So this is, this is a first started trying to look at dolphin to dolphin communication very specifically sender to sender, which again has been very tough in our field. And uh, his equipment actually samples at quite a high rate for us, at least the 667 kilohertz. So now we've been recording sounds up until 240 kilohertz actually, which is pretty high. So what that looks like for us technically is here are the little narrow band spectrograms I've been showing you with the whistles on the lower left here. And so now this is a sample of sound up to 110 kilohertz. And you can start seeing harmonics, um, which actually go up to about 100 kilohertz so far that we've seen. Um, we see the clicks here, which are broadband. Again, which we knew, we knew echolocation clicks were broadband. We just hadn't been able to record them. But now here we see a burst pulse sound. And there's no detection of this particular sound in the narrow band. So if you were just sampling in this area, you wouldn't even see any evidence of sound there. And so about 30% of our signals looks like we have no evidence of sound unless we're using our broadband signals. So it's really important to get into the, the, uh, the dolphin sensory range. So basically, we've been sampling uh, all our normal behaviors that we had sounds correlated with. And sure enough, there's pretty much high frequency in uh, many of them, if not all of them, such as squawks and buzzes. Now, one of the reasons it's important to look at high frequency is simply because we, there's a lot of things about dolphins we just don't know. We just don't know, for example, how they communicate with each other out of visual range and really uh, communicate specific information. And one of the ideas is that since high frequencies and harmonics are very directional, that they kind of act as a, an acoustic uh, beacon. And so this, this model has been uh, put forth by Mark Lammers in Hawaii and Patrick Miller at Woods Hole. And the idea is that in diagram A, you've got a dolphin. They're making a sound. You see the fundamental whistle and then the two, three, and four harmonics. And the uh, dolphins to the right, who are the listeners, they hear some of those harmonics, so they're all kind of going the same way. In uh, the middle section, section B, the vocalizing animal turns to the left. So now the high frequency signals are off to the left. The listeners to the right are only seeing, or sorry, only hearing partial harmonics. And so they get the cue that the uh, vocalizing animal has turned to the left. 
and then that they get the cue, and so they all turn to the left. So that, that's the idea that it's a kind of a, a beacon acoustically for big changes in direction because in the animals I work with uh, live in very small groups, but out in the open ocean in the middle of the Pacific, you get schools of thousands of animals, and it's pretty dark in the water. They don't really have visual cues, and we suspect acoustics uh, plays a large role in that kind of orientation. Now, I want to tell you a story about the, the whistle squawk, which is a specific type of sound. And this has to do with what's a signal and what's noise. So for many years, we were recording a sound, and it was in the literature as well, uh, from captive studies called the whistle squawk. We called it the excitement vocalization. And it's basically uh, a whistle that has overlapping uh, burst pulse sound. And it sounds like this. It's kind of a, a raspy whistle. And when we were doing our neural network, part of the process of using the neural net was to actually physically measure the contour of the whistle and train the computer that this was the contour of the whistle. And some of these sounds, which were signature whistles from specific individuals we knew, we couldn't really extract the contour because they were so messy. They were full of this noise and this squawking. For example, the uh, top spectrogram is Gemini, who's the mother of the, <laughs> the dolphin below. So she had this squeaky whistle, as did her son. And we really wanted to compare uh, you know, mothers and sons and mothers and daughters to see how their signature was compared. But we had to kind of throw it out of the data set because we couldn't measure it with the tools we had. So we had, um, this was about the time when we had Mark Lammers out who had developed our high frequency equipment and he was quite an, uh, a talented bioacoustician. And he kept wondering, well, maybe it's because of shallow water or it's some odd sound, you know, you just couldn't figure out why they were so noisy. And we finally started looking at it. Okay. All right, we'll hear a lot of whistles. Come on, computer. So we started looking at the signals closer and realized they were, instead of frequency modulated whistles, they were really amplitude modulated whistles. And they just were noisy and we couldn't measure them. When we started talking to colleagues and saying, hey, we've got this amplitude modulated whistle, it's not an artifact of the environment, it seems to be a whistle related to individuals and consistent, um, they started looking at their data sets from pilot whales and all sorts of species they were studying in the open ocean. They said, well, you know, we've collected a lot of those sounds, but we couldn't measure them either, so we threw them out of our data set. You know? So for us, it was a good example of, you know, this it may not be noise to them. You know, it may be part of a real signal, but sometimes our tools only allow us to measure certain things. And now we know these kinds of sounds are, are found in many species. Another really cool things, uh, thing that dolphins and whales do, and specifically killer whales, is they can hide their sounds in background noise. Um, so killer whales come in a couple different forms. So there are resident killer whales and transient killer whales. So on the left you see a spectrogram and a waveform of resident killer whales. Now these are guys that they live in the Pacific Northwest, they eat fish, and fish don't usually hear high frequency. Um, some species do, but most don't. So when the uh, killer whales are hunting these salmon, they just use regular spacing of echolocation clicks and their hunting clicks and they chase down the fish and eat them. On the right, you see transient killer whales. Now, these are whales that move around, and in addition to fish, they eat other marine mammals, such as dolphins and porpoise. So in this case, their prey can hear their echolocation coming. So what the transient killer whales do is they basically uh, hide their echolocation click patterns and communication signals within the background noise. So they have quite irregular spacing of clicks. So this is called acoustic uh, crypticity. So it's a neat way to hide your signals if you're a prey in this case, a dolphin or a, a porpoise. And somehow they extract their information between each other when they're hunting, but the dolphin and the porpoise don't hear it as hunting clicks. So that's a pretty, pretty neat skill. Now, these are audiograms of uh, some species of dolphins and porpoise. The dark black line is a bottlenose dolphin, Terceops truncatus. And the red arrows point out the most sensitive regions of their hearing. Uh, which they have around uh, 30 to 40 kilohertz and again in a higher frequency band. But one of the things we discovered with some of our high frequency equipment and other uh, researchers are finding this now as well, is that even though their audiograms show us that they shouldn't be able to hear above about 150 kilohertz, 
In fact, they're producing sounds that are higher than what they appear to be hearing. Uh, for example, uh, our uh, spotted dolphins produce sounds at 240 kilohertz, as do a couple other species now that have been recorded. And we really don't know why. We don't know why an animal would produce a sound that they didn't hear unless they were processing that information differently or it was some artifact of the production. So these are echolocation clicks up to 240 uh, kilohertz, and their hearing range is, seems to be cut off here. So this is a, still a bit of a, a mystery. If anybody has any ideas, uh, I'd love to hear them. So this is a typical whistle uh, looking at harmonics. So this is how we would generate a spectrogram looking at a fundamental whistle here, F, and then H1, H2 are harmonics. And we see the uh, intensity of the signal on the right. If you adjust this typical spectrogram for how the animals are hearing it, what you actually see is the animals, because of their higher uh, sensitivity areas and the higher frequencies, they actually hear the first and second harmonic better than the fundamental frequency. Yet as humans, we tend to measure this as we would hear it. So it's, it's, it's a pretty new technique to say, let's adjust what we're recording for how the animals might hear it, to try to think through what they're hearing. Again, this is some, an exercise we've had to go through um, from the human perspective. Now, categorizing signals is an issue. You know, I've shown you some basic categories. But one of the big questions in most animal studies are, are signals, are communication signals referential, or are they graded? So referential signals are something that refers to something. It labels an object, or it's a name. A graded signal is something that is more likely to express an emotional state or a motivational level. So like we have both, you know, we can refer, we have language and talk about things, but yet we can get excited and, and shout and scream. Um, the closest thing we have to a referential signal with dolphins are their signature whistles because they potentially actually are naming or referring to an object, in this case, another dolphin. Other squawks, maybe more graded system, um, or maybe their referential information embedded in those. But that's still a big question for a lot of species. Now, we do have some evidence of referential uh, signals in terrestrial species. We've known for decades, for example, that uh, vervet monkeys use different types of alarm calls for different types of predators. So they actually can communicate it's a leopard coming or an eagle coming, so their, their buddies will take the appropriate action. And some fabulous new work coming out uh, of a, a group in uh, Arizona on prairie dogs. Now, prairie dogs make alarm calls too, but what they make alarm calls for are usually humans coming through the field to shoot them. And so there's, this work is showing, if the, if the dolphins were doing what these prairie dogs are doing, the media would be all over it. Because the prairie dogs are actually encoding information in a very short alarm call that specifies there's a human walking through the field with a gun with a yellow shirt on. <laughs> or there's a human walking through the field with a red shirt who doesn't have a gun on. And so they'll communicate specific information so their buddies will either not worry about it or hide or whatever the appropriate action is. So, so far referential calls in nature are usually in situations of uh, survival, so alarm calls. But what's pretty neat about them is they seem to compact a lot of information in a short period of time for quick response. So this would be the difference between me yelling, look out, or Asteroid. <laughs> so with an asteroid, you'd look up and you'd, I don't know what we'd do if it was an asteroid. <laughs> but if I just said look out, you wouldn't know where the danger come from. So there's a real survival issue about communicating specific information in this case. And so it's not hard to imagine that a dolphin, for example, might have a really important use for labeling a type of, type of shark that was approaching. Like, is it a large tiger shark or a harmless nurse shark? I'd like to know those signals myself. <laughs> so I can get it out of the water. Um, so whistles are, in some ways, a little easier to categorize, and that's why they've been studied. Um, echolocation clicks are very short signals, uh, 70 uh, microseconds. They have a bimodal frequency spectra, and they're very intense, about 210 decibels, which is a blasting cap kind of intensity. And one of the ways we categorize uh, signals use with uh, clicks in them are echolocation trains. And we use interclick intervals. So the spacing between the click is actually one of the really rough definitions we use to separate what is echolocation from what is a burst pulse sound. So one is a social sound. So uh, click trains that have uh, interclick intervals that are greater than about 15 milliseconds 
are considered echolocation, so foraging, orientation, burst pulse sounds. If the interclick interval goes below 10 milliseconds, so they're compacting these clicks, these are considered social sounds. So this is a temporal measure we use to try to categorize these kinds of sounds. It's pretty rough, but it, there seems to be uh, pretty good evidence for that. Now, extracting meaning and interpretation is a whole other issue. So you can categorize signals. Um, and we have the luxury of observing our animals in behavioral contexts and relationships with each other. So there's a lot of metadata that goes into interpreting what the potential function of you know, a mother chasing a calf and holding her down, down and squeaking and disciplining and all that. So that's an advantage. But one of the things we've also learned in animal communication is that instead of just measuring a single physical signal, What's really important are sometimes the signal relations. So is a sound louder than the previous one? Is it uh, more rapid? Is it in rhythm or synchrony? So it's about the relationships of signals within a context of other signals that's actually been productive. Now these are um, synchronized squawks. So this group of dolphins is synchronizing, they're coordinating to look bigger and stronger and they're very rhythmic in their uh, vocalizations. And this is something they use. It's a pretty sophisticated way to coordinate. Now this is, um, this, these are actually bottlenose dolphins. And you'll see them synchronizing their physical behavior as well as their sound. What are they saying? Synchrony is, is pretty important, and it's been found in a lot of dolphin studies, either surfacing together, coordinating these kinds of events. It seems to be a really important mechanism they use to communicate uh, coordinated activities. Now, one of the things we do, because again, we have underwater video, is we also uh, use body postures to try to figure out what dolphins are saying to each other. And we do this by running uh, time streams of body postures that are coded in three-letter codes, such as head-to-head, HTA, or types of vocalizations. And then we can do things, for example, like count the number of head-to-heads uh, that exist in a sequence. We can look at uh, what, so what sound or body posture precedes a certain event. We can measure the length of a bout of squawks and maybe look at, well, what's going on here uh, with this uh, scream, SCR here, coming into this, this stream of squawks. So this is starting to get at, you know, looking at multiple modalities of communication together. And the idea is putting signals into a context now with other signals, not only vocalizations, but body postures, um, to try to interpret uh, meaning. Uh, one of the programs we use for this is called Observer. It's uh, created by Noldus. It's a behavioral uh, software program. And within Noldus is another program called Theme, which ac actually helps us once we code our either our body postures or our vocalizations, it can pull out to a certain extent certain patterns, orientations of A is always nested with B, and C is always nested with D, and A, B, and C, D are nested together. So it starts extracting potential structure. And if you're looking for a language or you're looking for grammar, you need to see order and pattern. So this is one preliminary way we can start looking at uh, some of the complexities and try to interpret a meaning. Now, there's nobody better than Gary Larson <laughs> to give you a review of dolphin communication. Not even me. <laughs> so here are these scientists. Habla Espanol, what's going on? So this is basically how uh, dolphin communication work was focused uh, from the 60s to the 80s. It was primarily in captivity. It was primarily looking at just the acoustic channel, not anything else, just acoustics. And I'm embarrassed to say we were looking for English. It's <laughs> a pretty American-centric thing to do as well as human-centric. And we didn't find it, surprise. But, um, but this is a reality, right? Science builds on itself. We use the tools we have. But there were, there were a lot of things that happened in the 60s and 80s that are of concern now, now that we know more about how dolphins make sounds, and that have actually led to a lot of misinterpretation of data. One big thing is the directional issue that I was describing to you. So 
just because of the scenario and the ability of, of scientists to see uh, who they were recording or what orientation the animal was, there's a lot of directional information missing from sounds. And what that means technically is that a lot of signals that were collected are probably partial signals because if you're collecting a whistle head on, you might get the full contour. If an animal turns to the side, top's going to be clipped off and you're going to look like you have a few little separate whistles in time, but in fact you are just missing that directional information. So it's really possible that the repertoires that we've looked at in the past, and, and it's still a bit of an issue for, for all of us really, are going to be incomplete signals. And so we probably are categorizing uh, our repertoires inappropriately. The second big issue, because of the way we've collected data in the past, uh, specifically in captivity, is dolphins are really great vocal learners. So one of the ways we think they learn signature whistles is to copy each other and then uh, modulate the sound to create their own whistle. Well, in 2002, there was a really interesting study that showed that dolphins in captivity, because they're trying to bond with the humans and learn from trainers, they, they were actually copying trainers' whistles and using them. And so these whistles were being recorded as signature whistles, but the dolphins had modified them because of the human influence. So it's a really big contamination issue, which I think is actually a really big concern to a, you know, a certain extent. But it's just what the dolphins do. Now, an interesting aspect of that would be to work with them and say, oh, what else can you learn? And you, know, you might take advantage of that. But can we call them regular whistles? You know, we don't know. And the third big issue is that functions of signals can be really different in captivity versus the wild. So if you're looking at natural communication, this can be a serious issue because captivity is an artificial social environment. So how are animals changing their signals and changing the use of them? The best example I can give you are bubble rings. So in the wild, if a dolphin produces a bubble ring or a torus, we call it, it's a sign of impending doom. Okay, so this animal is really pissed off. He's about to start a fight. And you really wouldn't want to mimic this in the wild if you want to communicate with a dog, <laughs> because it's what they do, it's their signal. Now in captivity, and there's a lot of uh, video on the internet that shows this, dolphins actually create these bubble wings and bubble rings and will use them as toys and play with them, which is actually very cool and it's very creative, but it's not naturally how they would use the signal. So again, it's an adjustment for captivity, which again is fine, you could explore that in their creative nature. Um, and they do some actually pretty cool things. One thing we have learned from how they use bubble rings in captivity are that the rings themselves can be invisible, so the dolphin creates this motion in the water, and apparently they can insonify this ring and see it, and humans can until they, the dolphins go over and they inject air into the ring. And then they create a visible bubble ring for us, but they've been playing with it the whole time. So it's a really neat way to look at skills, but interpreting the function of these signals is really where the issue is, if, at least if you want to look at uh, their natural communication. Now, um, in the Bahamas, we also have uh, bottlenose dolphins who are resident and interact with the spotted dolphins. And they do some pretty unique feeding. They dig in the bottom like you saw the spotted dolphins do. But they do this really deep digging called crater feeding. And for years, we had watched them do this crater feeding. And one of the things we saw them clearly do on a regular basis was they could be up 10 meters in the water column. And they would just be scanning scanning the bottom, either listening or making high frequency. We're just still not sure exactly what they're doing. And then they would get some information, and then boom, they're down, and they pull out a fish. And this is, this is what some of their sounds sound like. So that's the scanning sound. And they make these funny little digital turtles. So these are fairly unique to the, this species. But I was showing some of this video at a, a biosonar conference where there were a lot of Navy guys there. And uh, one of my colleagues, I had given him some video. And the Navy guys didn't believe the dolphins could do this from 10 meters above. They're like, no, it's not possible. It's like, well, look, they're doing it. So what's going on? And the reason was because it didn't fit their theory of sonar signals. Because what, in fact, our history had been is that all the studies on sonar had been measured from dolphins that were stationary. So they were put in a, uh, a, uh, on a platform. So they're not moving, and then we're measuring their signals and doing things with the objects, but the dolphins themselves are not moving. And so that's how sonar theory was really derived. And the dolphins, in this case, were actually breaking what's called the two-way travel time rule. And the, it goes something like this. So a dolphin produces a click. The click goes out, and it's supposed to come back. 
before the next click goes out because they have really fast sound processing. Uh, sound travels really fast in water. And as I was describing, you know, we define uh, different kinds of signals by the interclick interval. So there's either echolocation trains when that interval is greater than 15 milliseconds or less than 10 are social sounds. What the dolphins were actually doing in this hunting strategy is they were sending out click A, but they were sending out click B before click A came back. And this was totally breaking the travel time rule. So, and no one could really figure out why. We just suspect they're processing the sounds differently for some reason. And in fact, what they do very consistently is as soon as they get less than about a half a meter away from their target, that rule breaks down and suddenly they're sending out really rapid clicks before other clicks come back. So this is just what they do, but we hadn't measured it because the way we had experimentally measured dolphins was in a stationary position. And shortly after that, the Navy set up a range off San Diego so they could test dolphins echolocating as they were moving to different targets to see what they would do. So again, kind of a good example. I mean, captivity and those situations give us really good experimental control, but sometimes we forget that that's not exactly how the animals are operating in the wild, and so it can really throw our theories off. So we need to supplement it with uh, real, real data sometimes. The uh, third area I'll just touch on briefly uh, that I think dolphins relate to um, SETI and astrobiology is simply as an uh, exercise in direct contact, should that ever occur. But one way to also look at it is what do other species do with each other? You know, other species interact and communicate on a regular level. So what do they do? Well, in the Bahamas, we have, again, these two species, bottlenose and spotted dolphins. And part of the time, they forage together. Not very often. There's a bottlenose on that red arrow way in the back there. But they do pretty neat social things together. Uh, they babysit each other's calves, which is pretty cool. Uh, they have some dominance relationships between the male spotted and the male bottlenose when they're uh, chasing each other's women. And when... Uh, occasion calls for when there's a third party intruder like a shark, these two species of dolphins will form uh, temporary alliances and fight off the intruder together. So they have a very complex social relationship and they seem to communicate on some level, whether it's broad or, or simple, we don't know. But terrestrial species do uh, some pretty neat things. Um, one strategy, strategy is to eavesdrop. So species, a couple species of monkeys you, uh, learn to use each other's alarm calls to detect predators, as well as species of birds tap into uh, each other to figure out alarm calls. But dolphins do something uh, pretty unique, and that is instead of eavesdropping, when they get together with other species, they actually develop shared mutual calls. It's not a shared language necessarily, but it seems to be easier for them to create a, a new system of communication than to decode each other's. So in Costa Rica, some really neat work uh, with two species of dolphins that look like when they get together, they have a certain subset of, of vocalizations they use, and then when they separate, they go back to their own sounds. And we've actually known for quite a while that uh, orcas in the Pacific Northwest who live in very distinct pods, and they have different dialects, and when they get together, they have shared calls that they only use when they're with that other pod. When they break up, they go back to their own dialect. So they're creating mutual systems for shared advantage, I guess. In fact, that's what we've done with other species when we've tried to um, bridge the communication gap. And it seems actually like a, a pretty good strategy. I always used to think, well, why don't we just decode their own signals and then we can use their own signals to communicate? But in fact, it's pretty darn hard. I mean, it's still hard, and, and we have a lot of technology now. But there are pretty good examples of uh, bridging the gap with species that can't uh, make human sounds. Like birds can mimic human words, for example, so there's some really nice work around that. But for uh, chimpanzees and dolphins, they just do not have the vocal abilities to mimic human words, and so we have to bridge the gap with technology. So there's, there's a whole history of this, and there's a lot of studies that deserve their own talk, but um, probably the highlights are Sue Savage-Rumbaugh's work with uh, Kanzi, the bonobo chimp, using a, a keyboard, a physical way for Kanzi to communicate pressing keys uh, symbolically. And dolphins, there's a fairly long history of uh, keyboards from the Navy work in the 1960s, actually, interestingly. Uh, John Lilly, Diana Reese all had uh, keyboards in the 80s. This is a keyboard in the late 1997, or sorry, in the late 1990s. This is probably the most sophisticated underwater system that was ever designed for dolphins. And it was basically a, a keyboard, and the dolphins could trigger it by 
uh, putting their rostrums in kind of a, a bucket that had infrared beams, and so they would break the beam and be able to sort of touch it. So they could request to the diver certain actions, like let's go to the reef and look for a fish, or the diver could do the same thing, and then they'd go off and do something together. So it was actually a pretty neat system. Um, we always have trouble with dolphins because they're so quick and we're so slow. And so <laughs> they had some pretty neat results that came out of it, but typically what would happen is the dolphin would request something and they'd go over to the reef and they'd wait for the diver. And, just, <laughs> and they're kind of like little kids. They, get, they you know, need attention, they need activity. So we tend to be a little slow in our technology and that's, that's a challenge. But this is a way that we have to actually tried a direct contact. And we've learned a lot of things about the process of communication and um, one of the things I was talking to uh, some colleagues earlier about is that the only system that's really worked with communicating with other species in these scenarios is a system that was really uh, designed by um, Irene Pepperberg with her work with Alex the Gray Parrot. And what she did is she revitalized a, a framework called social rivalry. So this is how she worked with Alex. So the idea is that if you're a social species, you want to really connect with uh, who's around and you want to get in the game, and so you compete for social interaction. So she would have a human be a parrot, and she would be a parrot, and Alex would be over there watching them communicate, going, oh, you know, I want in on the game. And this is actually the model that worked really well with the chimp work, I mean, with a lot of other complications, and also with the dolphin work. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we actually took that idea out in the wild in the late 1990s when the Epcot work was going on. We worked with the colleagues there a bit on the concept, we took a keyboard out into the wild, and did the same thing. We modeled the system. We, uh, we basically associated a visual key with an acoustic a sound with an object. So, and we know from captive studies that dolphins can um, correlate objects with whistles. We know they can relate and learn how to label things and then use them uh, pretty functionally. So we thought, wouldn't it be neat to try in the Bahamas? Because these, these animals are actually pretty interactive with us, and they're pretty curious, and they seem to have social time. But the only reason this was possible is I think, with a wild group of animals was specifically because we had the history with the society out there. We knew the individuals. I had grown up with a lot of them, so we had relationships. We knew their personalities. We had a pretty good sense of their own signals, so we knew how to read both their body signals and certainly some of their acoustics. And so it was a little easier to try to interpret what was going on, because it's hard to control. It's not like a real experiment in the wild. It's more like an exposure, exploration kind of a model. So this is, is one way we can actually uh, look at dolphins as a model for how we might interact with another intelligent species should we ever see them. Um, I wasn't going to go into this too much, but basically the last couple years we've actually been trying to step up the technology and we're working with a group at Georgia Tech to build us an underwater wearable computer. So instead of a physical keyboard, we actually want to be more like the dolphins are, which is just create sounds ourselves and hear sounds ourselves. So it's a, Pretty neat system. It has a couple of hydrophones that receive sound and can identify the localizer to a certain resolution. Uh, it projects sounds, so we have a very small um, repertoire of artificially created sounds that label objects they like to play with. And then it has real-time sound and pattern recognition, a system built in so that the human diver will get uh, information as to if the dolphin mimicked the sound and so we can respond appropriately. So it's, it's really a time when we have technology available. We know a lot about other species and there's a lot of complexity and other species already communicate a lot with each other. We're just a little slow in the game, um, but we have a little technology edge. <laughs> so there's a great quote, something about never underestimate the importance of a first impression. So we've certainly seen this with our, uh, with our our dolphin work, um, how important it is to understand their signals and try to be appropriate. And uh, I hope next time you think about dolphins and SETI and astrobiology, you can think about all the relationships and hopefully we'll get some good dialogue out of it. Thank you. If you have questions for Denise, put your hand up. I'm, I'm going to start off with um, one question, Denise. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that the, um, the, the, the personalized uh, signals um, that the dolphins send to each other and then they mimic back. Do the bottlenose, or do we know if the bottlenose uh, dolphins do the, do the same thing or, or, you know, 
like say I'm a bottle bottlenose. And you I'm know, a spotted. Yeah. Do you, you know, hear my personalized clicks and echo them back or? We don't know. Right. Yeah, we don't have those data. Right. Yeah. It's... We'll know soon though. And, and, and another one, seeing as that was such an easy answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it looked to me like the dolphins are moving around so much. They're moving their heads so much. They must be missing a lot of information from their, you know, from their movement in the in the ocean. You know, they're, they're not always facing each other. What are your thoughts on on that? Like, uh, how you know, do they often turn themselves around in order to communicate things with their high frequency the parts you, of them? You know, well, it's interesting. So these dolphins live in clear water, and actually, they're really sometimes they're more visual than they are acoustic. So, they're, like I said, they're passively listening a lot. They're not always actively putting out signs by any means. And I think what they're doing a lot of the times is they are just hearing. They're just listening for sounds, and they'll not necessarily put out sounds. You know, there's another really cool thing that uh, dolphins do, and um, it has to do with eavesdropping and sort of hearing signals and understanding them. So when a dolphin sends out a, a click and it comes back, this is called a highlight echo. So bats do the same thing. and Research on bats is a lot more advanced. And what bats can do with this highlight echo, so they are echolocating on, say, a prey over here and a prey over here. And they can tell from that highlight echo if this is a, you know, a certain kind of moth and that's a bigger moth, et cetera, et cetera, and by all these angles. So the highlight echoes seem to actually function as real, you know, specific information. So what researchers have done with dolphins is they've done what's called a phantom echo test. So they recorded the highlight echoes of a dolphin. So the dolphin would echolocate on an object, highlight echo would come back, and the recording equipment would record the echo, and then the researchers played back the highlight echo and fooled the dolphins. The dolphins reported that some object was present, but it wasn't, it was just the highlight echo. So there's a lot of information available in some senses, and in fact, another thing they did at Epcot was they kind of tested the highlight echo thing and said, okay, how much information do you get and where do you have to be to get it. And it turns out that like when a calf is with a mother, they're often in this position sort of upside down. So a calf has to be within a certain range of his mother and maybe a certain angle to hear the highlight echo that is coming back from the mother's click and that's how they probably learn what objects are. So they're passively, it's like us looking at photons reflected from something at different angles, you start learning what objects look like. So this is one way that dolphins also learn from that information. So. I think they're listening a lot more than anything. This is a two-faced uh, question. Um, written word is so important for us to um, learn. I was wondering if you can comment on that in general, that they can't, you know, do a writing uh, utensil. And then I, I was thinking, you know, how could you get them to sort of record or have a, a written uh, language and so mm. you know um, I, I almost imagine that since they can recognize a, a TV set it, um, three-dimensionally that you could have a, f a fake dolphin almost showing them how to record how to write. Sound, yeah or <laughs> record sound and then mm. play it back you know and, and so a more sophisticated apparatus than what we saw the um, yeah. Marines were doing. There, there actually was another advanced keyboard uh, at Sea Life Park in Hawaii that actually tried to do something like that. They had a, a situation where the dolphins were in a tank, they couldn't really access the dolphins directly, so they had a, uh, an underwater screen on the water side, same thing, and the dolphin could trigger it with calibrated a screen with infrared beams. And that was calibrated to a computer inside, and so the dolphin actually could use an iPad, you know, it could touch things. And so that actually was, was pretty interesting, I mean, again, it was it was more for the dolphin to explore things on a computer and trigger things and watch colored lights or things flying around. Um, written language, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess humans had a lot of like they oral. Play a, push a button and play back a sound. Yes, right. They did that actually. Yeah. yeah. So they could pick a signature whistle and choose it. Yeah. So yeah, and it was and it was it was really interesting because I was there doing some other work because there were three different labs in Hawaii and uh, Ken Martin, who was leading the lab there, they had set up this experiment, but the dolphins weren't really coming over and using the computer. And so I was working with one of my colleagues that works with me in the Bahamas now, Fabian Delfour, and we were like, well, let's show them how it's used. It was that whole modeling thing, right? Modeling the communication system. So we actually would sit there and play with the computer, and they'd come over and watch, and then they kind of got the idea, and then it would start. 
exploring it. So it's really important. It's like our kids, right? You know, you, they're used to observing us and modeling us. It's, you can't just like give something to another species and say, okay, figure it out. Figure out what, you know, I want you to do. Because it doesn't work. You know, you can do exercises like that. Yeah, and that edit. might be sort of an engineering tool to possibly right. explore. Yeah, I think the trick is to give them an interface where they have a tool that they're interested in, and then what can you do with that tool? Yeah, that would be really interesting. Do you, just to follow up, yeah. on, do you know the sound for food for them, or, you know, hungry? Have you figured out? Well, you know, we don't really know if they have words. You know, that's, that's yeah, yeah. Re it's like a dolphin's you know, echolocating. It's like, okay, so we put a microphone at your kitchen table, and you're eating, so we hear eating sounds, but are you talking about the day at school? Yeah. Are you talking about the food? You know, we don't know. So we have sounds of them, yeah, foraging for food, and they're squawking in between or fighting. So we just, you know, we don't have that Rosetta Stone yet. You know, we're actually hoping in our situation that the, the technological interface, even though it's very simple and we think, you know, they can use it on a simple level, we're actually really hoping that that could be a tool where they could start showing us some things. And in fact, we're planning for that in our design is to have sort of an open uh, key on our keypad so that they start, you know, they come up, show us a, an object from the sea floor, you know, a starfish or something, and make a whistle. We're like, oh my God, is that their, their sound for starfish, maybe? I mean, we don't know. But it's a possible way to interface to say, hey, this is what they're showing us. Maybe we can show them. And they may not have words either. I mean, it may be a completely different system. But yeah, and as far as written language, I mean, you know, humans had oral history for a long time, you know, by memorization and detail. Yeah, I don't know how you get around that one. I mean, one of the definitions of language, of course, is that you can talk out of time, you know, time displacement. You can talk about things that happened yesterday and today, and you can still do that, obviously, with an oral language. But yeah, they definitely don't have hands. So, <laughs> well, it's an interesting idea. Hi. Um. Fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that dolphins can make two different sounds at the same time, simultaneous sound, and so can birds. Birds can make sometimes, you know, more than two sounds mm -hmm. at once with a syrinx. I'm wondering. There's been a lot of work done on birds' sound, birds' song, etc. Has any of that been helpful to you in your dolphin research? Um, you know, certainly. I mean, bird song, whale song. Um, Probably the biggest difference is that, you know, we don't know that dolphins have repeated song sorts of displays. You know, we know humpback whales do. Um, yeah, of course, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's just so different with dolphins. It's so hard to control the things that you control with, you know, bird research in a lab. And, you know, you can't really do brain research on dolphins for the most part. So it's sort of hard to get at, you know, is it innate? Is it instinctual? You know, where's the, the mechanism? But yeah, of course, I mean, it all feeds in there. And yeah, you know, I think probably the most productive thing is just some of the, the tools, you know, some of the software tools for categorizing sounds. Raven is a perfect example from Cornell Bioacoustics. You know, it was designed after, you know, bird vocalizations for the most part has been, been applied to, you know, for many of us for our work. So yeah, definitely. I wanted to ask about your bubble rings. You yeah. showed us one bubble ring. Right. Uh, there's been some discussion of bubble rings uh, uh, connected to other bubble rings. So one goes through the other one. Mm. And people have been trying to build that mathematically really? and build experimental ones. Have you? S the claim was they first saw that among dolphins. Have you, you seen that? Uh, you know, I think in captivity they have, where they would create a bubble ring, not in the wild. I have not seen that in the wild, for sure. Um, but they create a bubble ring, yeah, and then they'll throw that in there. Yeah, that might be valuable footage for, for them to look at for building a model. But I'll tell you one thing we have seen in the wild regarding uh, sound manipulation in bubbles that I think is really interesting. Um, for years, we watched the bottlenose dolphins on the bottom looking for fish, right? And we would always see them swimming on the surface of the sand, and they would kind of tap their little flippers or their flukes on the sand, and they'd swim. And then they'd come back and kind of fish in that area. And one time, I was down on the, I happened to just be down on the bottom filming what they were doing. And this one dolphin went by, and he flipped the sand. And I was looking at the sand, and all of a sudden, there was a little sand tornado. And the sand tornado moved around, and it stopped. And the dolphin came over where the sand tornado was and dug out a fish. And I'm like, did he just create a tool to find a fish? <laughs> and then when you talk to the, a, a vortex scientist, they tell you that 
such a, a vortex will fall, will go to low pressure and stop. And so that was a pretty cool thing that the dolphins do. So they're really good at manipulating water. And like I was saying, you know, they, they create these rings in captivity by just swimming fast and swishing their dorsal fin. And again, they're manipulating the water, but you don't always see it until they inject air into it, and then it becomes visible to us. You can see what would be very difficult to get the interview. They're woven. Yeah. Because that now becomes stationary. I'm trying to remember if to do that they broke the first ring and then injected another ring. You know, they broke it physically with their rostrum or something. I have to look at it, though, but that actually could be really neat footage for you to look at. Yeah. So, Denise, um, water, particularly salt water, is highly dispersive. And you've been talking about different types of signals that have a range that is way beyond the visual range. So is there any indication that these broadband, very short clicks, that the dolphins are using the information of, as those sounds disperse through the medium? In different levels, you mean? Well, the different frequencies arriving at different times, that they can get information mm. out of that. That's a really good question. Um, you know, probably the Navy has honestly looked at that. I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I mean, they, they, as far as we know, echolocation clicks themselves are about, you know, a half a mile or a kilometer. That's a good question. I mean, certainly, like, humpback whales use the SOFAR channel, which is the channel where salinity and temperature, right, maximize that, that channel. So I imagine that could be a possibility. But, yeah, I don't know anybody that's looked at it. Hi. Um, a while ago, I, I read some research, there, a research line, and what you mentioned it about the reverse echo, I think. The idea that the dolphins may be able to create a reverse echo to say, let's all go to that good feeding hole, and they'll actually throw out so the other dolphins see the reverse You mean the highlight echo? echo. Yeah, the yeah. highlight echo. Yeah, have yeah. you found that, has, has the scientists, have the science found that that's actually one of the ways they can communicate by projecting an image? No, we thought about actually trying that. No, what the researchers did was actually just play back that signal and try to see if the dolphins were fooled by that highlight echo. But did, have we found that highlight echo, highlight echo in their natural communication system? Uh, no, but we haven't also like ensonified the objects in their environment to create that echo. And you know, and then the echo is at different angles, so it really has a completely different shape, you know, with the subtleties. But I think that would actually be you know, a potential way to communicate that information. Because it's kind of what they, they yeah. listen to passively, right? They so recognize let's all, it. Let's all go read over there. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've had instances, for example, there's one I can, I can tell you specifically where um, we were out with the dolphins one day, and we saw this male stubby who we knew really well, and he was with some mothers and calves. And these big group of bottlenose came by, male bottlenose, and they sometimes bully the spotted because they're, they're bigger than the spotted dolphins. So they were kind of beating up on st stubby. And he didn't have any of his buddies around, so he was pretty beat up. So the next day, just, just, just happenstance, we ran into stubby again. And this time, he had his whole super coalition of males, and he was chasing the bottlenose. That, that beat him up the day before. And so, so there's a situation where you're like, OK, did he just kind of say, come with me and not explain anything? Or did he specifically recruit, I, let's go get this guy. You know, he really messed me up yesterday. So, so you see those little snippets of like, seems like you'd, you should be able to pass on specific information. But that really would be language to a certain extent, right? That would be yesterday this happened. And, my intention to do this is this versus just a bunch of body language. So again, you know, it's just so hard to know. But no, I think the highlight echo is, uh, we thought about putting that in our two-way system, actually, to try to see if that would be a, a way to create a word or, you know, label something in their vocabulary. Because, yeah, that could be a way to, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, it's sort of an unknown. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I didn't get um, the point you were making with the prairie dog and 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 your studies. Uh, do they do dolphins see like they do, or I mean signal no. like they do, or not? Yeah, I was I was just trying to give examples of terrestrial animals, which we know actually a bit more about, about how they encode information specifically in their alarm calls, and that that like the vervet monkeys are giving alarm calls for specific predators, so are the prairie dogs, but they're also giving a lot of specific information regarding different 
factors in their environment all in this alarm call. So whether the human has a gun, what color shirt the human has on, and I mean, it's pretty cool stuff, really. So the, the, the idea was that we do have examples of terrestrial species that we know label things to a certain extent, so they have referential communication. It's just that it's harder, harder information to sort of extract from dolphin communication. Yeah, that really, that was it. I know, it's very, you should, you know, check out his work, uh, Slobodchikov, uh, he has a great book out on prairie dogs. You know, he's convinced that a lot of animals have language and that we just have to look closer at those signals to decipher them. I was wondering if you thought of uh, building a robot uh, dolphin to follow all the other dolphins around and mimic them and stuff like that. So let me tell you about the robot dolphin. <laughs> no. no, actually... <clears throat> We kind of ha we have, actually, if we get them used to it and comfortable with it and send them off with a video camera and, you know, hydrophones and all that. But in 1969, and I can't believe no one's done this since, in 1969, uh, I think it was McVeigh, a researcher, built a dolphin toy, and it was a submarine, and the submarine was controlled by sound. And they had just arbitrarily decided, okay, when the dolphin goes, the submarine will go right, when it goes, right, the submarine will go left, and so forth. So they put the submarine in the tank, and the dolphins quickly learned to drive the submarine around. <laughs> so then the male got really horny and started chasing the females around. And so the females were uh, driving the submarine to get in the way of the male. <laughs> but then the male got upset, and he went and slammed the submarine into the tank. <laughs> And that was in a submarine. <laughs> so it'd be a pretty cool thing to build, and it would be probably productive. And there are some really nice, so Japan has a lot of nice underwater robotics going on right now that actually have some pretty neat organism-like robots. So yeah, we thought about that. I don't know if it would scare the dolphins more, or if it would, you know, they'd probably beat it up. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it could be a pretty cool tool. You know, there, there have been attempts... Um, like that, now with robot, robots, but um, there were a group of researchers at the Long Marine Lab up here who um, thought, let's train a sea lion to carry a video camera and go swim off with a blue whale, right? Because they're able to do it. I don't think it went very far, but you know, it's a cool idea to tap into you know, those natural propensities. Just wanted to ask if um, you're basically dealing with the dolphins in the wild, and I was wondering if you also worked with the ones that in captivity like Dolphin Research Center in Florida as well as uh, uh, in the wild with the uh, Eckerd College. Eckerd College. Yeah, um, I used to. I was actually at Marine World uh, you know, for my graduate work here with Diana Reese uh, decades ago. Um, I don't really do a lot of direct work. I just don't have the time, honestly. I mean, I've been an advisor to Dolphin Research Center and things like that. But I really try to focus on the wild, really. But, you know, the captivity informs us a lot about things. You know, there are definitely things in the wild you can't do in captivity and vice versa. So, you know, it's instrumental. But I, you know, I think there are challenges both ways, so you just have to be aware of that. But no, my work is mostly focused in the wild these days. Yeah, I, I'm amazed how large the, looking on Google Earth, the facilities that the military has in San Diego. I mean, acres and acres of pens. Yeah. And also the former Soviet Union's pens in the Black Sea as well, too, which are visible. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of dolphin pens, but they're not so much for research now. You know, there's a huge black market for uh, selling dolphins to countries that have a lot of, uh, well, they have no regulations on taking wild animals from the wild and putting them in captivity, which we, in this country, we don't really, you know, we breed uh, animals for captivity. But there's a huge market, unfortunately, that you know, people are taking wild animals, you know, from all over, which is not a good thing, at least in my book. So that's part of that. Okay, um, there are no more questions. <clears throat> Denise, we have a uh, special Are We Alone Ooh. mug. I think in your field of research, the answer are we alone? has got to be no. Hello? <laughs> 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 oh, it's a coffee cup. Yes, yes. It's coffee. Don't get any of the dolphins playing around with it or anything like those robots and stuff. Please right. um, join me in thanking Denise for a great talk. <laughs>